I'd like to call to order the Wednesday, September 12, 2018 meeting of the South Boroughs. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. First order of business, as usual, is audience sharing. Anybody have anything to share? All right. We'll move on to um, new business and back to school opening. We're back nine days in to the new school year, and um, a lot of folks here this evening, um, certainly our administrative team, but um, those from central office usually join us at uh, the first meeting to talk about what's happened over the summer. There's lots of work still continues, uh, even though our students aren't with us. Uh, I do think I need to address the bus transportation issue first and foremost, because I think that was the most significant um, back-to-school um, event that we've all had to deal with, and I'd like to... Um, recognize and extend uh, appreciation to those folks at central office who basically have been manning the phones and creating uh, spreadsheets and trying to address the issues in a very team oriented way. This year we um, took a change of um, scheduling process by having NRT, which is our bus company, North Reading Transportation, schedule the routes. Uh, we learned um, last year, and I had mentioned it several times at school committee, that customarily the bus company, because they are the experts at scheduling, um, and I use that term I know not uh, strongly uh, at this point in time because I think some would take issue with that as well as perhaps us. Um, but in most cases, they do about 90% and the schools do about 10% of the tweaking. And ordinarily, any bus schedule you wouldn't think would change that significantly um, in a course of a year because for the most part you have 12 of 13 grades that are fairly stable. The only change you have is moving the 8th graders to the high school in a different transport um, or whenever you have a, a building change. That would warrant uh, a change of bus perhaps number or route because of the time. In this case, and I know this isn't going to be a popular comment, but I'm almost glad that it happened this year even though it's been incredibly explosive and difficult to deal with because at the same time uh, I'm not sure we would have noticed the um, sort of deficiencies in the way that we have been scheduling for some time. And so in the nine days we've addressed a significant number of issues. Uh, I won't say that we're 100% where we want to be. Um, I want to thank Greg uh, for uh, marshalling a team of folks which include Nancy Bissett and Cheryl Lepre, um, who have been looking at spreadsheets and calling the bus company um, I myself had some um, very challenging conversations with the owner who uh, I'm not sure we're going to be answering one another's calls too quickly the next couple days. But um, in addition to the regular difficulties, the, you know, the normal startups with transportation where buses are running late and it takes a while to tweak the times of arrival, um, we've had some athletic issues and pick up after school with late buses, those <coughs> kinds of uh, those are issues we contend with every year. But what we did notice is that our database uh, needed to drastically be cleansed. It was the same database that we've been using for a number of years. We had, we were carrying uh, 200 unenrolled names in that database and uh, that needed to be removed. And we also had a number of students whose names were not even in there. And that really exacerbated whatever change we were attempting to make this year in good faith with efficiencies and um, routing. So uh, that, really created a lot of challenges. And it's the same database that we've been using to schedule from um, and with for some time. So that's why I say I think if we hadn't had this occur, we wouldn't have realized that we had all these issues with different students um, in, in the database. So um, I feel fairly confident that having done that now and tying it into our student information system where um, the bus numbers of students will also be gener generated with a direct match to match of enrolled students that we've addressed whatever gaps were identified this year. Um, and so one of the things that I'm you know, hopeful um, with is that last year we were talking about buses into October. It wasn't such an explosive situation that we were dealing with right at the start, but it was discussions that we, would, we still had into our October school committee meetings in, in a couple of the districts, so of the three. So I think this year we're all in at the beginning of the year, and I'm hoping that we won't have these longitudinal discussions about busing in, into October. 
Uh, but having said that, now I think I can have a better appreciation for um, why, in fact, that might have been, because I think we were doing far more manual scheduling than perhaps we needed to. So um, what, will good, what good will come out of this? I think we'll have a database that's um, accurate, <coughs> and then as we move forward for next year in scheduling, and certainly there will be conversations about this, um, being more mindful of a mind-to-mind -mind match of the students who are enrolled in our school. Furthermore, in a perfect scheduling world, you're moving K kids, K students onto the bus routing. That is the one new sort of group of students and anyone else who's new to the system, not 200 and 300 every time. So that should really pick up our ability to quickly address transportation issues as they come up. There will always be transportation issues, um, whatever they might be. I also want to propose to the school committee um, that as part of our policy subcommittee work, uh, we look at creating a transportation policy, which we, we don't really have. So in part of the work, um, trying to figure out you know, what's, what's, what's the state requirement, what's the ruling, I also uncovered um, a lot of language about some conversations we may want to have to just create a policy that's a little bit more um, rigorous in terms of aligning our language with the state so that wherever and whenever um, we have something to go back to and, and have these conversations in subcommittee and bring it forward. So I think you know between uh, shifting the scheduling uh, and having that as an opportunity to see where the gaps were and now sitting down and you know spending, maybe, it's a difficult policy that we will be having conversations about perhaps. Um, we don't need it for another year basically, so we have really time to be thoughtful and thorough with that and would recommend that um, you know, this discussion move to South Borough Policy Subcommittee. Um, and I know in your packets, there are four meetings then, so there'll be some good work that we can do with that. I just want to thank um, you know, all the parents. Uh, it, it's been challenging. Um, some of the parents we've had multiple conversations with. Um, one particular bus of nine days, the same driver only uh, appeared behind the steering wheel three times, so there have been substitute drivers as well. And um, you know, the bus company's been contending with that as well. I do have to say something about <coughs> NRT because I think we also have to be appreciative of the challenges that they had. Um, when I you know, meet and speak with other superintendents, um, I don't think there's any perfect bus company that's out there. There's a shortage of drivers, and some of the challenges that we're confronted with, they are as well. So um, a lot of folks have asked me, where are we in our contract? Um, we had a three-year contract, and then we had two years to renew at the same price. So it would not be my recommendation at this point to say that it was just NRT, and that I think you know, continuing the partnership with them, we have a whole year to make a decision. but. Um, I, I do have to go on record and suggest that they've tried to be as yes, uh, time sensitive, although it wasn't instantaneous, which to us is what time sensitive means. Fix it now. Um, I think they've been fairly responsive given the, the difficulty of the situation. So I thought just addressing it and then we can <coughs> listen to the joyful start at the schools because I think besides the bus issue, which we decided to take in at Central to keep the issues away from the schools, and to give us some understanding of what the problems were so we could, we could address them systemically instead of 10 times uh, worked because I think for the most part a lot of those issues uh, weren't at the school level and they didn't have to call NRT which is great because they could focus on welcoming the students and the teachers back and the parents. Okay. I do just Go have ahead. one question. Sorry. Um, could you just speak to whether there's any sort of additional process that's been put into place now that would include maybe an in-house review of the bus routes before they're implemented? Because mm -hmm. I think one of the issues um, that I noticed when I was looking at, let's say, our route was that the houses were listed out mm -hmm. of order and not how they would actually come up for the driver. And so I think there were some issues that required more local knowledge right. than maybe what NRT has. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a 
maybe an enhanced process in place for the next time around? That's a great question, and um, you know, we, we do have, and as we were going through, we identified some things we would do very differently. I mean, it's been, it's been handled this way for many, many years until now when we turned it over, and as again, um, you know, I just want to underscore, I think it was waiting to happen. Um, and so we are um, going to do the transportation as a team, and that team will include Lorraine or the data specialist. Because what one of the things that we uncovered is that in order to put the bus numbers in IPASS, which is the student information system, there was no pull through process. So we had all of these students without bus numbers. And so Lorraine, because she's a database wizard, quickly created a database that would address that issue. And so one of the things we know that we're going to do is really sit down with currently enrolled student information and just pull it through. Uh, it's TransFinders, the scheduling system, so that we can assign bus numbers at the same time, which will guarantee a one-to-one -one match. And I think a lot of that, um, you know, uh, I'll be completely upfront. I don't dig into the transportation because it's been done the same way for a while and you know appreciate the fact that um, probably like I should have been more in the management level of, of the bus transportation routes for the most part because it had been done the same way for years and you know I know we took to October uh, to, to finally work out the tweaks um, I'm not sure if we would have noticed there was a deficiency in the database because I think a lot of this had been done manually scheduled along the way so what we've done is we've decided we're going to have a team approach to scheduling. So no one is the master of transportation. It's done uniformly. And I think with that, the reason a lot of the bus numbers may be out of order is because we were putting these kids back on the route. Mm -hmm. And now when we have the route, I think it's, it's naturally going to come out sequentially. So between those two things, I think that would be a big, a big plus and a step in the right direction. So that's a great Thank question. You. And as we go through this, we're jotting down more. I'll give you another example. Uh, throughout the summer, when students have been added to our routes, a separate email has been sent. So if I was on, um, at the bus company and I handle one of multiple districts, I'm receiving a lot of emails. What we've really decided is that we're going to build a relationship that says every Friday you're going to get a Google Doc with all of the changes that have occurred through that week, which hasn't been the practice. And so that then really just focuses them with one communication. And we can check on that one communication instead of seven or eight emails that are going back and forth, perhaps daily, whenever a student enrolls. Big efficiency, uh, for, you know, step forward. So those are some of the things that we've been talking about since this. Anything else on buses? Yes. Um, can you clarify what you said in the beginning? You said something like usually they do 90% of it, or did you say? No, usually we were doing 90%. And so that's what really stimulated the conversation. Like, why are we doing 90% of the scheduling when most districts have the bus company doing 90%? Yeah. So um, it's transferring TransFinder to the bus company. And one of the things that we've been talking about uh, with them is that they simply don't have enough perhaps TransFinder stations that are active at any one time that are servicing multiple, you know, districts. So somehow to link ours more effectively with them so that we can do a mirror instead of a total turnover. So that's another thing that we're talking about with them. So that's my update. Not as joyful as greeting the students back, but when they got off the buses it was joyful. So um, I just like to, you know, turn it over to the principals to hear how opening day was. Sure, I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> um, first, I want to thank Khalid Baba, Robert Mullen, and all the custodians and students who took part in cleaning the building over the summer. They did a tremendous job making our school sparkle for our open house and our first day of school. Um, Speaking of the open house, we had ours on the 27th, two days before the start of school. We've been doing this for several years now to help minimize students' anxiety uh, before the actual start of school. It's a tremendous benefit uh, for our kindergartners, seeing the classroom, seeing their teacher, meeting some friends before the start of school. Um, and it helps teachers connect in kind of a, a low-key way. We have two new staff members at Finn. 
Victoria Bonham, who's our new special education teacher. She's replacing Margie Lobanco, who retired after 23 years, I believe, in the district. And Faith Richards, who is a, working as an educational support professional in our preschool. Our first two days back were incredibly productive, uh, even though we were dealing with the intense heat. Uh, the first day was actually sponsored by Tom's of Maine monsoon strength uh, deal. It was, it, was that, it was that hot. Um, our staff were in overdrive with paper towels. We should add that to the budget. Um, uh, we. <laughs> We had a great PD for our staff. We had our service, our student service providers provide overviews of domain specific things that they could do in the classroom to help students adjust in the areas of OT, speech and language, behavior, and academics, uh, which was very well received. At our first parent coffee, I gave a general overview of Finn, talked about the importance of the homeschool connection. Um, and gave parents opportunities for volunteering and how we're going to expand some volunteering opportunities this year. Um, and then we have some new additions and upgrades at our school. We had some Boy Scout troops, Steve and I both had this over the course of the year, reach out to us for Eagle Scout candidacy projects. And Alex Scouty, and I gave credit to him in MyCellPro.com, did a great job organizing a facelift for our courtyard. So, he had a group of scouts, parents, kids come in to Finn on Saturday, a Saturday in June, and they revamped, landscaped the entire um, courtyard. It looks gorgeous. Uh, we want to try to maintain that. That's the first phase of our courtyard. And then through a, tr a very uh, generous donation from SOS um, and Chuck Romando, who does New England Recreation Group, we have two new pieces of playground equipment that are being installed out back in our playground. And so we're excited that these pieces are very developmentally appropriate for our preschool population and more conducive to the ADA requirements for special needs students. So we're excited that we're moving in that direction. Um, and then finally, another SOS donation, uh, a series of colorful banners all highlighting the values that our care program and open circle um, program uh, promote during the year acceptance, uh, generosity, honesty, we have those hanging down in our hallways. So if you have a chance to stop by Finn, we would love to show you around and um, sh show you some of the new things. And lastly, I really have to give credit to our staff. They did a great job being positive, rallying, organizing themselves, greeting parents and kids with smiles um, during a very tough week. As Superintendent Johnson pointed out with the buses, um, it wasn't easy for our start, but they did it, um, they rallied. So we're off to a good start at Finn and excited to get going. Momentum. Um, thank you, Clayton. Just want to echo um, Clayton's sentiments around Brian Fantoni and the great work that he did in preparing our facilities um, this summer. It was quite an undertaking, especially at, at Woodward with the building project taking place next door, but he did a great job working with Ed Mercer and Joe Mancini, our two custodians at Woodward, to get the building ready. It's in beautiful shape. Um, if you attended the open house, you saw um, what a great condition and, and learning environment was created over the summer for our students. So extremely thankful to Brian and his hard work. Um, our new neighbors have been excellent neighbors so far at the, with the public safety building. Um, there's been some loud banging here and there and <laughs> some rocks being moved from one spot to the next. It's completely fascinating our students, but overall it's been a great experience. Um, I have to um, commend the town and DPW for the communication. Um, over the summer we were worried that um, access to the building could be quite difficult, but it, it turned out to not be an issue whatsoever. Um, Karen Galligan at the town um, was helpful in um, having different pieces of machinery out and, and um, you know, out of the parking area when necessary, as well as preparing the parking lot for opening day of school. Um, it had been used as a staging facility and, and everything was put back um, just the way we would have liked it. So um, thank you to her and her hard work. Um, we've had several site meetings um, at Woodward <clears throat> and walking the campus just to see um, the scope of the work and how it will impact our students. And, and I'm, I'm happy to say again that it really will have minimal impact on our students. It didn't really impact at all for opening day. Um, buses were able to come and go um, as best they could without any kind of interruption to traffic whatsoever. Um, so again, I would just want to um, 
praise the town DPW um, and town manager for the, the communication and really the seamless work that was done over the summer. Um, as far as uh, exciting news happening around Woodward, so um, this year we kicked off kind of like a virtual tour where um, we had put up all sorts of um, instructional videos and um, tours of the building that students could access with parents online. Um, that was a great way to kick off the year. It ties back into our PBIS and um, preparing our students for the expected behavior that happens around Woodward as it carries over from Finn and as students move on to, to Neary. So that was one thing we were extremely proud of. Um, parents can go online, access those expected behavior videos. It really just helps solidify, um, uh, strengthen the homeschool connection so parents know what to expect and what's being asked of their students. Um, another thing we're extremely proud of is our work with Chief Paulus. Um, we're starting a lunch program with the South Dakota Police Department where officers will come in weekly, um, talk with the kids, join them for lunch, um, walk the playground, um, directly tying into the work that uh, takes place in Neary uh, through the D.A.R.E. program. So we, we realized that last year, um, during some rather stressful times, students really um, didn't know how to react seeing a police officer on our campus. Um, we want to change that narrative and really show them that this is they're a positive um, member of our community and one that should be sought out for um, safety and guidance. So that's something that we're excited about also. Um, we're in the process of transitioning one of our classroom spaces into a multi-purpose science room where we'll be conducting, um, we'll be using our Carolina science units as well as using the design process and our root coding robots. So that's one thing we're, we're also pretty excited about. Um, and uh, lastly, I'm happy to announce that two of our teachers had their first child this summer. Mm -hmm. um, Colleen Black and Jill Farrah both had daughters at the end of the summer. So we're, um, we're happy to, to grow our Woodward community by two. <laughs> Not enrollment. No, no, that'll be a few years down the road. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, so, great start to the Neary school year as well. I did want to thank Mike Daigle, who is our new head custodian. He was our second shift custodian, now he's our new head custodian. And we brought Joey Sinclair on board as our second shift custodian. So, they worked really hard again with Brian Fantoni and all um, the support throughout the summer that they received from the hire, the new the summer crew. We have a new fresh painted hallway and entrance and it looks fantastic. They're working on the dining room now too, so it'll be really um, a wonderful space. It's this very soothing blue color. So we've got a positive response to that. I also want to thank the tech department because we had new phones put in over the summer and it's it's been very smooth i know behind the scenes i'm looking at julie but i want to thank julie and um galen hammond and andy moriarty and all of the um, support staff all the staff on in the tech department because really they have been so proactive in addressing any concerns that we've had and it's it's been a great um thing to bring into our schools at all of our schools so so thank you um we also have been working with one of our Eagle Scouts, or he's in the process of uh, earning his Eagle Scout badge, Garrett Goodney. He's helping to expand our Neary Courtyard to a greater learning space for us. They're built, he's building six new benches and a platform for teachers to teach from. We were also able to um, get some canopies that we'll put over that space so that students can and teachers can be protected while they're outside receiving some great learning in a great space so looking forward to that we have five new esps that we brought on to our team this year so we're welcoming debbie engel emma decker who's a near alumni so that's exciting working alongside her former fifth grade teacher so that's great megan kehoe aaron schuster and katrina ballard so we're we're very happy to have them on board and a huge kudos to our teaching staff for their preparedness and working collaboratively to get the classrooms ready to receive our learners and it's just it was a great opening day and so it's all um, in part because of the work that they put in during the summer um, we want to thank our SOS for for distributing our kids our school kids supply <coughs> kits it's a new company that we went with this year, and they just did a seamless job bringing in the kits, distributing them to the classrooms. So when the teachers came in, everything was right there for them to access and distribute to, to our students. Our 
traditional Neri ice cream social, which typically happens on our first day back, because it was about 98 degrees that day. Cream soup. <laughs> cream soup. Yeah, right. We thought <laughs> probably not the best day to have our ice cream social. So we rescheduled that to uh, September 26th. So we're looking forward to that, meeting all of our families and having great conversations, as well as ice cream that won't melt on our plate. <laughs> so hopefully, we're hoping the weather, weather is on our side. We continue to expand our science lab, which we brought into Neri last year. As Mr. Mucci mentioned, um, with our Carolina science kits and um, our hands-on resources and materials. Our Friday farewell meetings this year have shifted focus a little bit. We're having multicultural moments brought to us by Lisa Wagner, our uh, librarian, and Hope Cross, our ELD teacher. So we're looking forward to that. We're also continuing our partnership with the Senior Center. Our whole school read is going to be identified next week. And this Friday, we have our picture on the hill, which is our live um, human word picture that we, uh, we all get together, staff and students. And this year, we will be spelling out the word hello. So we're excited about that. Choosing kind continues to be a theme in our school with common language tied to our care themes and our caught caring cards. As Mr. Mucci mentioned, DARE officers um, are an important part of our school and our community. And so Aaron Richardson is completing his DARE training and he'll be partnering with uh, Officer Landry this year to bring our DARE program to our fifth grade students. But he's been in getting to know the students, playing on the playground with them, He's great at basketball. The kids mm -hmm. like enjoy that. And he's also been in our dining room having lunch with both fourth and fifth graders. We continue to um, do our best to communicate as much as possible to our families. We use our virtual backpack, the near website, our TV in the foyer, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, Instagram. And uh, we try to share as much of the learning and experiences that are going on at Neary with our with our parent community. And today we had our volunteer parent uh, principal's coffee, and I invited some of the parents, and they came tonight. So thank you. Um, it was a, a great, uh, well, um, well attended, and we are so grateful for our volunteer support and what they do for our school community. And last week was our curriculum night. It was a, it was a great success. Teachers worked really hard to prepare um, an overview of their curriculum and share students' work and expectations. And all in all, it's, it's just a great start to the school year. I'm so happy to have our hallways filled again with, with our students and, and our staff. So we're looking forward to another awesome year at Neary. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Gary and I are here to uh, share a little about Trottier's opening, I echo a lot of what uh, my colleagues have mentioned so far, but we won't get into a ton of that. What was different for Trottier is that Trottier was busy with students this summer. We had uh, three uh, special education programs uh, happening for a majority of the summer, up to uh, eight weeks, as well as the recreation camp. So typically, the recreations camp is at uh, one of the other schools, but because of construction and other things moving, uh, recreation camp was with us, and they were great tenants. They were awesome. Uh, they really were. They took care of the space, took care of the building, communicated with us frequently, and we really Really had a pretty seamless summer when it comes to all things related to those programs. Um, new staff for Trottier, we only have two new uh, educational support professionals that are joining our CASEL program, Jacob Strout and Jen Guy, who just started uh, this week. They joined us and have already gotten right into business and are doing some good work. They, they come with a great deal of experience too, which, which certainly helps. Um, like my colleagues mentioned, the heat was a little bit of a story. Heat and buses, I guess, uh, was the start. Uh, but it really became something that people just embraced and, and did the most with as much as they could. Um, our first couple of days, we don't dive into classes. The bell doesn't ring and join classes. We do do some community building. And this year, our students were introduced to their Generation Z. So our students are members of Generation Z. And Gary and I did a whole school uh, presentation. Gary did a majority of all the work. But it was very fun presenting with him about all the stereotypes related to Generation Lazy of being lazy, <laughs> screen dependent, uh, self-centered, and so on and so forth. But what really the evidence shows is that this group uh, that's coming through 
aren't necessarily all these negative stereotypes, but are more global, more diverse in their thinking, and able to make de uh, better decisions, even in relations to things like substance abuse and things like that, the numbers are down for this Generation Z. So they're listening to something we're saying, at least. It might be for only eight seconds because they got to go to the next thing, but regardless, <laughs> good things are being captured. So for a while, there, we were getting booed for telling them they were the worst generation ever. <laughs> and then fun to come out, they have a lot of potential of their growth. So afterwards, they're like, OK, now we get it. Um, but for the first half hour, I think we were struggling, right? Maybe. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. yeah. We were struggling for a bit. So, we're off to a good start, hopefully gave our students something to think about as we begin, begin the year. The other big initiative for this year that I want to share is Canvas. Uh, Canvas is a learning management system that Algonquin adopted last year with a ton of success under Julie's uh, leadership. Uh, the middle schools, both Trotter and Mellican, are adopting it this year for teachers and students. And really, the best way to summarize it, it's one-stop shopping for everything related to what's happening in the classroom, from resources to assignments to a calendar to a grade book. It really has a lot of options, and all of our teachers are using it. It's not just elective. It's something that all of our teachers are, are using, have embraced a lot of hours of training, and are going to be showcasing some of that tomorrow night at our curriculum. So tomorrow night, um, we'll be following a mini Tuesday schedule, and we'll do some speed dating every eight minutes, switch to the next class for about a two-hour period. But uh, Canvas will be highlighted in many of the presentations. So that will be on display for parents uh, tomorrow. Um, and I think that wraps up the start of school. Is there anything else That's I it. missed? Is that it? Do well? All right, good. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Ready to roll. Thank you. A lot of great things. It's hard to imagine yeah. all of that's taking place just in nine days back uh, to, for the school year and so much more to follow. So uh, again, thanks to our teachers. We had a yes. district professional development day and um, they launched with such enthusiasm back to their classrooms on Wednesday, I think, and um, got some pretty good feedback from that. But it all does come down to what happens in our schools and what happens right in the classroom with our teachers. And clearly, all of what's taken place in nine, in nine days shows how prepared and excited they were to have the students back as well. And to our administrative team for making um, what takes place in our schools each and every day so exciting for students. And we do have some updates from central office because uh, I think we've been pretty much there all summer. And um, lots of happen has happened there too, good, all good for our students. So I'm not sure, Marie, do you wanna? Sure. We'll wrap up with Greg here. Wrap up with we'll Greg. wrap up with Greg. Okay. okay. So for student support services, our district uh, and our school year does not end in June, as many of you know. Our summer was again bustling with activity for our South Borough students who continued their academic and social learning through our extended school year programming. ESY serviced 61 South Borough students. We offered seven programs in 25 classrooms across all of our, all of our districts across four schools. Three of the schools were housed uh, by South Borough students at Finn, Trottier, and Mellican. Our principals and the custodians were again so helpful in maintaining a beautiful learning environment for students and staff over the summer as they ready for school, uh, the schools for the fall and we're very thankful for their support to be able to juggle the summer services and getting ready for the fall. We held uh, the second annual transportation meeting with Vanpool and Aspen Valley Collaborative at the end of last year, another, uh, another uh, request from parents who wanted uh, to know more information about van transportation over the summer. It provided to be hel a helpful information session and we will continue this practice for next summer due to the response that we received from parents. Our assistant special ed directors in the audience, Deb Lemieux and Erica Edstrom, and I traveled the district during the free, first few days of school. We visited with principals, teachers, and students. We stopped to visit our elementary therapeutic learning program at Lincoln Street School, which houses some of our South Borough students, and the Castle and Neck Partnership programs at Trottier, as Mr. Lavoie has already mentioned. These programs provide the necessary supports for some of our students. <coughs> to experience success in their learning. We witnessed students busily engaged in activities to start the new school year in all the programs that we visited. Our preschool program welcomed a new early childhood administrator, Jennifer Henry, and as well as all of our students, again in one facility at Finn School for its second year. Uh, screenings for some open slots were already held last week and our numbers continue to grow. 
We're currently reviewing the results of our coordinated program review that was held over the last two years, and it ended in June of this past year. And its purpose is to audit special education, civil rights, and English learners uh, regulations. And I'm happy to report that Southborough received a very favorable special education outcome. All timeline and regulation requirements were 100% compliant in all of our schools, mm -hmm. first time ever. <laughs> uh, we are proud of our staff and administrators because without them, uh, the, the support and the good work that we do for students could not happen. We'll share more information with all of you once the final report is, is available. So it's been a wonderful start to the school year as evident from our visits to all of our schools. Our teams were energized and prepared as they began the new school year. Thank you. Can you review, say that again about sure. the favorable outcome in 100%? 100% special ed regulation compliant in Southborough all of our schools. And that is how many SEs were those? How many indicators? About 60 something yeah. indicators. And, and we were reviews. And record reviews. We did, oh boy, how many record reviews? We did 35 and then another 30. Yeah. So through all of those, 100% compliant with all the special ed regulations. That's we fantastic. That's mm -hmm. excellent. Congratulations. Thank you. I think that's the first time. First time. So, first time. Yeah. so I have a quick question. Sure. Um, really off the top of your head, I guess. Uh, what are two or three of the most difficult things to comply with have you found in the past? Uh, Not necessarily the number one, two, or three, but just, you know, something that... that um, I think maintaining the consistency across all schools and making sure that all of our teams are prepared. We, we offer professional development. We work on timelines with, with our staff and it's really keeping ahead of things. So I think um, to answer your question, it's more timelines to make sure that we're compliant, to make sure that we're giving the individualized attention to our students and developing the programs that are required to meet their individual needs. And I think we have to keep ahead of the curve all the time because there's always new, uh, new populations of students coming in and out of the district uh, students as they transition from school to school, making sure our programs are up to date, uh, and that's all looked at in an audit. So you mentioned making sure we're prepared. Uh, how, do, how do they measure being prepared? Uh, <laughs> due to execution? Or, or, or? They, look at our, they look at student records to make sure that all of the timelines are adhered to, that the IEPs, we were told that our IEPs are some of the best written that they've ever seen, that anybody can just take an IEP and know what to do with a student in terms of their education. Uh, so that's looked at, as well as the programming in each individual building to make sure that we're supporting our students with mental health and various other disabilities. Along with the professional development. Along with the professional development, obviously, that we do with our staff. It doesn't sound easy to comply with all that, so I'll say the same congrats for Thank your you. comment. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. So I am uh, Rebecca Pellegrino, Human Resources Administrator, and the summertime is um, my busiest time of year. Uh, it's the, the period of time where we're kind of gearing up um, to get everyone back in the classroom so that we can make sure that um, all of our staff are in place. Um, as the principals had already mentioned, we um, did have 11 new employees that we welcomed to the district over the summer. And that number is actually relatively low compared to other years. Um, however, that does not mean that it was any less challenging because I think many of them occurred within the last few weeks before school started. So it was kind of like an obstacle course where things were just uh, being thrown at us um, at the last minute and we had to, to dodge and weave. <laughs> Um, so, uh, these openings did occur due to either resignations or we did have some staff transfers into new positions and um, Clayton did mention a retirement as well. Um, so there was a mixture of reasons as to why those openings occurred. Um, over the past year, Human Resources has continued to review um, the processes that we have in place. And one of the things that we've really um, tried to do is move a lot of things for our staff. 
um, onto the district website. Um, so I really have expanded the use of that. Um, we've worked with our associations to put um, forms that have been created um, together on so that staff can access them at any point in time. And if they have any questions, they know where to go to access that information. Um, we've also expanded our use of the Infinite Visions um, uh, system. We are using it now for greater tracking um, to improve our efficiencies. And in fact, over the summer, um, we did coordinate another training for our accounts receivable um, module. So that will um, assist our financial coordinators um, in terms of um, tracking receivables um, from various parts of the district. Um, and we also worked on our um, web portal, um, again, with Tyler Technologies, and that web portal um, will be coming up at the beginning of the new calendar year, um, where employees will be able to access their um, W-4s, their pay stubs, they'll be able to make changes, um, they'll be able to uh, you know, see any education that is in our system and um, then work with us to make any changes that are necessary. Um, so we're excited about that um, because that is something that we have been um, planning to roll out to our employees. Um, this year, all staff have completed our annual mandatory trainings, and that includes trainings that have been um, compiled by our special education attorney um, for their review and sign-off, and also the state's conflict of interest law um, that is mandated um, by that must be completed every every other year. So we have been tracking that. Um, and um, I'm actually in the process of working with our insurance provider, Maya, to provide some um, expanded trainings to our administrators as well for this upcoming school year. So it's been a busy summer, and I look forward to an even busier school year. Question? I'm reading ahead, but it's, it's, I think it's relevant. So I noticed that uh, a lot of special ed um, changes, mm -hmm. you know, as, as far as the aids, which must uh, present some human resources challenges in that transition, as well as maybe some supervisory challenges, I guess. Is that is it kind of normal that we see a lot of transition in that situation most yes. years? So when it's not we hire, I mean, most of our special ed, uh, we, are, we call them ESP yes, now, okay. uh, <laughs> and, and they, uh, they're they very highly trained. Most of them have uh, licensure. They, most of them have bachelor's degrees. Most of them are looking to get teaching jobs, so they're in the process of getting teaching jobs. Uh, this happened to be an extremely good year for our aides to find right. teaching positions mm -hmm. outside of our district, so now we're just backfilling those. We did try and make sure that some of those aides were absorbed back in if we had teaching positions open. That's where we go first. But when we don't have that, obviously, they're, go they're going to go out and look for their next career. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about technology. Uh, for the upcoming school year, the district technology team will be working hard to manage devices and infrastructure so that our students can learn those valuable skills like collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. Our instructional technology specialists at the Sunflower Schools, so we have Sandy Scordano here at Tronier, Amy Brewis at Neary, Amy Benford at Woodward, and E.B. Hall at Finn, will continue to support both students and teachers um, with classroom technologies. Um, as they have in the past years, they provide instructional coaching to teachers, and they meet regularly with students um, to teach curriculum that includes digital literacy, internet safety, computational thinking, and also at the same time exploring some STEM education experiences. Uh, what helps to make all this great teaching and learning happen is the um, Southborough School's impressive ratio of students to devices. So from grades two through eight, uh, we are one to one, which um, and in some cases even a little bit better than that. Um, in grades pre-K through grade one, the ratio, that ratio is two to one. Andy Mariotti and TJ Karen, who are our district technology managers, worked very hard over the summer with the district tech team, um, just making sure all these devices are updated and ready to go, as well as an enrollment um, 
of all of our students into our online instructional programs just to make sure everything's ready to go for our teachers and students at the start of the school year. Um, in order to ensure uh, the successful sort of one-to-one -one initiative that is going on, and, and as Keith mentioned, at Tridier, we have successfully launched Canvas. Um, so just echo to what Keith said, it's sort of this one-stop shopping. It's, it's uh, all the digital tools that teachers use are located in one, one place. It really um, makes teaching and learning a lot easier. It makes communication and collaboration easier, and um, it helps the kids stay organized and get valuable, more valuable feedback. Uh, we are also piloting a new cloud-based internet monitoring system called GoGuardian, and uh, this is a great digital classroom management tool, and it allows teachers um, to <coughs> see what web pages students are on in real time, and it allows them to block certain web pages at the same time to help them to stay focused on, on the lesson. Um, our tech support team has a high level of technical knowledge and will be working hard to provide fast and reliable assistance to our teachers and administrators. Galen Hammond um, is Selfro's new systems admin and he, along with the tech specialist uh, John Wiggin, are creating a schedule to maximize their availability and to just best meet the needs of all of the four schools. For the grand finale. The grand finale. That's a lot of pressure. Just one question about Go Garden before we Do the kids know about this? <laughs> <laughs> um, so right now at Trottier, we have four teachers who are trying it out, and those kids know about it. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> He's not quite the grand finale. Road is over in the corner. So she's going to come to us. Switching. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing with you uh, this evening. I'm Rhoda Webb, Director of English and Education. We had yet another wonderful summer for our English learners. Um, our, we have a three-week program and a two-week program. Our incoming first to eighth grade come to the two-week program, and it is um, held in August. Um, we had a total of 28 students from um, Algonquin, uh, sorry, not Algonquin, Southborough attend, and I mentioned Algonquin because as always, we form a community and bring Northborough, Southborough, and Algonquin together, and we choose the staff that teaches in our summer program. We choose an overarching theme. We look at our standards and areas where we want to develop the English language for our students, and then we were teaching it in developmentally appropriate ways. This year we looked at, this summer we looked at the standards of math and social studies and decided that we wanted to develop the language of business. Um, specifically math in the younger children with money. Um, we bought very realistic fake money for all our <laughs> students. <laughs> and um, so a lot of activities were done first through third grade, um, learned the, about the causes of choice, saving, um, Playing interactive games with money, buying and selling um, services and goods, um, and then fourth and fifth grade added to those concepts by building a budget and what a budget means. And so once they had uh, out of their paycheck, rent had been taken out and um, uh, at all their monthly expenses, they were left with about $100 and they had to decide how to use that $100 for self care and um, food. So they became very good at looking at flyers from stores, learning the language in the flyers and how they were going to spend their money. They also developed um, our culminating project this year. Every year we bring everybody together, so we're interacting multi-age. Our culminating project was Market Day. So our fourth and fifth graders this year were designing games that they could offer um, to, the, to the buyers, and the buyers were our younger students. And uh, before their games were approved, we had a team of our shark teachers who were deciding whether they would invest in their product or not, and if they, their language was persuasive enough to convince them to invest in their company with their product. Uh, middle school and high school um, looked at the concepts in depth of entrepreneurship. Um, we had an entrepreneur come to us. We didn't go out on a field trip this year. Uh, a bilingual bicultural entrepreneur. The students were thrilled when they heard the language that they had been learning about business because he was using that language um, and talking about his successes and his challenges. Um, so 
middle school and high school did market research um, among the students that we had in our, in our summer program and then developed products. They actually made products, um, did a market research cost, uh, what they would make, what profit they would make, the expense that it, uh, it was costing them to produce that product, and then they had to um, come up with a very persuasive um, uh, comment or very, very persuasive language on how they would sell their product to others. Um, and then at market day, that's when everything came to fruition. There was a lot of energy that day. Everybody had a role to play. Uh, students had a budget. Everyone went with their cash to spend and decide if there were, it was a need or a want. And um, everyone went home with that money to be able to take it home and continue to use it at home and play with it. Um, I am very grateful for the staff that commits. Um, this is a collaboration of everyone coming together and designing something that's going to be meaningful to develop the English language in our students. And um, our surveys that went out both to our students and to our parents were very positive. So we're looking forward to another school year, and I look forward to coming back later on in the fall to give you an update uh, of the languages in our district and who our English learners are. Thank you. So as you can tell, the work over the summer does not stop. Um, I'd like to com commend the South Pro educators for their participation in many of the programs that took place, whether they were running the programs or teaching in the programs. Um, we also had many, many teachers participate in professional learning opportunities, um, whether it was engaging in learning our learning management system, Canvas, or um, learning about our world-class instructional design and assessment program. Um, we also hosted a responsive classroom training um, it was, uh, that brought together educators across New England. Um, so that was a great, great experience. Um, and a lot of work from teachers around planning and preparing for this academic year. Um, this summer we also um, implemented our innovative approach to professional learning, um, which is new this year, um, which provides differentiated and flexible uh, professional learning opportunities. So we had about 40 educators begin that process, and um, from the sounds of it, from some of the anecdotal information, it's been a huge hit so far, and we're looking forward to sharing more information about that program with you. Um, the learning of uh, the NASA team also <coughs> took place over a two-day retreat where um, the leadership team came together, and we focused our learning on uh, teaching and learning um, and set goals for the year around instruction. And we also spent some time learn, learning more about the regulatory environment and the changing legal landscape. And we had one of our attorneys present to us. So it was a great year to kind of frame the year and set some goals for the leadership team. And then on August uh, 28th, uh, um, teachers gathered the 10 schools, three districts, one community of learners. We gathered at Algonquin, um, and we had a uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Brooks, present um, and his message was really uh, important and I think timely and he spoke about the power of a, a charismatic adult in a student's life and influence educators have and the impact educators have on students and we have a choice of what type of adult and what type of influence we have on students. Um, so it was very timely. He talked about the making positive connections with students and, and the power of that. So overall it was a very busy summer and um, I think I'd also like to commend the principals. It's amazing. I don't think there's any other organization that stops most of its operation in June, shuts down for a little bit, and then starts up again in um, late August. And the amount of work it takes uh, to start up an operation, the I's that are dotted, the T's that are crossed, the planning, the detail work um, is tremendous. And honestly, I don't think we could have a better team of um, leaders uh, to make sure that happens uh, well for our students when they return. So a great summer and looking forward to a great year. I just want to echo those thoughts and I think we've all shared them as, as we've talked about our own staff and you know, within our schools, our teachers within each building. Um, I also think that it's so very important that we have these types of conversations at the beginning of the school year because it really does um, act as a springboard for the conversations that we're going to have uh, throughout the next, over the next 10 months about budget and programming and budget priorities some of which we're going to undertake today um, and begin those conversations because that, in fact, does influence to a larger extent what our budgets 
uh, will look like in just, uh, well, this year, two months from now. Um, we have a rigorous budget calendar. And so to hear all of the great work and to want to continue that work in each, and our, each of our schools, also to continue to support the kinds of um, goals that we had identified in that strategic plan uh, is so very critical to our growth and our innovative practice. So even though it takes a little bit of time, the clock ticks that first night, but it ticks in such a very powerful way uh, because it will then provide the support and really the, the foundation for our conversations that will continue uh, over the next several months. And we'll hear more as every principal presents their school improvement plan. We'll be able to dig a little bit deeper into what's happening in each school when the plans are presented. So thank you all for being here uh, tonight. Any questions? Can I just make a comment? Sure. Um, I just want to say uh, I've only been at two of the four schools this beginning of the year, but I just I just want to say how much I, I really appreciate all the positivity and enthusiasm that everybody brings to the beginning of the year because it's obviously a lot of work and starting it all up and getting everybody adjusted, but um, it's it's evident to me anyway just the the, the enthusiasm and and how hard everybody is working to kind of make things go well. So I just I think it's wonderful. Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. I think Katura was in the audience when Dr. Brooks spoke. He <laughs> talked about charismatic adults with positivity. So that's exactly the theme for the year. So. Thank you all for coming. It's, it's really helpful to hear all this. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you being here and all the work you do. <clears throat> with that, we'll move on to legislative update. I have two. I got nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have something. Um, Last year, we had a very interesting conversation with Carolyn Dykema, and Carolyn actually asked if we would be interested in forming somewhat of a subgroup uh, along with her to talk about innovative practices that are taking place in our schools and find ways to have our legislative branch kind of support those initiatives. Um, she reminded us of that conversation, I think, and uh, circled back with us, and we're trying to um, figure out a way to implement and start that very active subgroup. I know we've shared some dates and times that might work for us, and, and actually Southboro was uh, the catalyst for that conversation, and I think the other districts will join in because together uh, we can all make a difference in terms of uh, the things and the bills that move forward or the bills that move forward before uh, the House and the Senate. And um, a little bit later we're going to talk about one of those successful initiatives, which actually I don't think would have been realized if it hadn't been the um, activism that takes place in our school committees. We finally uh, were able to determine that circuit breaker was increased, and we had a lot of conversations about that. And I know that it's it's going to be further down. We talk about the budget, but in fact, that was one of our latest legislative updates that was ongoing, and it's been ongoing for years. So in the end, uh, with the recent fourth quarter um, payment that was made to the districts, and it sort of just arrived. It wasn't a fanfare about the fact that Circuit Breaker had actually gone back to the 72% funding level, but it did. And so in that fourth quarter, we received, uh, every district received a little bit of bump in their Circuit Breaker funding, which will allow us to have some safeguards in place for this year should we have, or should we incur um, unpredicted special education costs. So that was huge. And it was funded at a 60% level. Uh, interestingly enough, we don't really yet know what FY19 is going to be funded as that, so we might be still having that, you know, uh, conversation again about returning us to 72% level, but at least we did realize that in the fourth quarter. And um, I think in large part that's because of what we had heard along the way that what the state really does is wait to see what kind of funds are unexpended because there's an opportunity to apply for those funds, and if people don't, it, it's money to return back to the cities and towns. So I think we benefited from that. So that would not have happened if the school committees and uh, you know the organizations hadn't kept the pressure on to to, uh, to to put that and to keep that first and foremost in front of our our uh, senators and representatives. So it does make a difference. And we did get a new, I know school safety is coming up. Uh, the governor, in collaboration with the Massachusetts Police Departments, have issued a new memor memorandum of understanding. Uh, Chief Wallace and Chief Liger from Northboro, myself, uh, along with some um, additional folks uh, on the Safe School Readiness Planning Committee, uh, were in the throes of uh, re 
authorizing our memorandum of understanding. Southboro never actually had one signed. Algonquin did in North Bros was in uh, format form, but not signed. And we had heard that they were going to issue some new language. So to wait until this uh, came out, uh, there were all, there was also a lot of conversation um, through the governor's office this summer about some funding coming our way for safe school readiness planning. Uh, there are there's a lot of language still, but I haven't really seen anything definitive. Certainly, we'll capitalize on that if it's, there's some grant writing opportunities so that we can continue to upgrade our schools and and provide uh, professional development and so forth for our schools. That's I, that's what I have for legislative updates. I'm sure there'll be mo a lot more to come in the upcoming months. Yeah, actually, the <clears throat> the committee that we're looking at forming it, it's more than just um, innovative practices, although mm -hmm. that was one thing that Carolyn and Alice Peich, who's chair, co chair of the Joint Committee on Education, they're interested in that kind of thing. But it's also just trying to get other school committee members from surrounding towns together and come up with sort of you know, some issues that we all care about because we're all similar situations and hopefully raise our profile at the State House. We're still in the formative stages of all that, but hopefully it'll come together. I think that brings us to old business and the public safety building update. So we've touched upon the next uh, several agenda items with the principal's updates, which is great. The public uh, safety <coughs> building project is still underway, and they circle back with us. Uh, Jason Melanowski sent an email out just a little bit ago asking, you know, how the start of our school was, and is there anything they could do to provide some additional supports? And Steve's been very, um, very much a part of that process, actively involved all along the way. We did, in fact, meet about four times. Uh, had a very lengthy meeting on the steps of Woodward School, I remember, um, with the project manager and Mark Purple, Karen Galligan, uh, to discuss um, and to make sure that the access to the public school building uh, throughout this construction period really did not impact um, school life at all, whether it's um, folks in the um, construction, on the construction crews, or just golfers who are still access accessing that facility. Uh, which is hard to believe. They're still golfing while bulldozers are bulldozing, and dynamite is uh, you know, going off and getting the kids excited at Woodward School. Um, and so from through some very um, great work together, uh, it was decided that they would build a new access uh, road for the golfers so they wouldn't be needing to move across or on Woodward property. So that was a great thing. Um, we've been working with them very collaboratively as they need to um, continue their work uh, to tie into Woodward's line where necessary for monitoring uh, the septic system that they're putting in place. I was pleased to see that they very much are mindful of our school calendar, so when we're not in session, they have managed to schedule some of the more um, you know, significant on-campus work that they need to do to connect into the public safety building. A good example was Monday. Um, they knew we were not in session, and that was the day they pumped the septic. Uh, which happens to be <laughs> underneath the flagpole. And uh, so we're circling back to make sure that um, that doesn't need to happen again or um, are they going to disrupt that asphalt because uh, perhaps then they can pave it back and make it part of our paving project for us as part of that. So there's been some great conversations. Um, I think one meeting, Steve, we had probably 10 folks. Uh, Chief Morrow was there. Um, Gosh, everyone from the town, and that was uh, when we were looking at the Woodward electrical panel because they need to temporarily hook into that panel. Um, some ongoing conversations about the installation of a phone line, and so it's just good conversations that are taking place, and I think they're being incredibly respectful, um, as are we of our new of our new neighbors. Um, we're pleased that'll probably be the number one field trip site for all of our Woodward students and yeah. everyone will want to be a police officer or a construction engineer by the time this project's done because yeah. they get to peek out the windows. Chief Paul did um, confirm that that would be an option for us is taking it and yes. sure once the building is completed. <laughs> yeah. And he promised not to bill us for the field trip. Right. I think that's a conversation. <laughs> no, I'll yes. say that um, at, at no point has work be, um, taken place while stu students mm -hmm. are in session. Um, like uh, Superintendent Johnson said, they're doing it on the weekends, they're doing it after hours or before school starts. They're taking advantage of um, some days that our students aren't in session. So um, we're, that's my hope is that that will continue so that if there is any kind of disruption, if they, anything does happen that's unexpected, that it won't affect their students directly. How about the dynamite? 
<laughs> you know, I haven't heard any dynamite. That might be an exaggeration. I, <laughs> I was just using explosive <laughs> terminology. <laughs> Definitely picking up big rocks and throwing them down. <laughs> but they are moving some pretty good-sized boulders, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. We were a little for surprised. For a while, the pile just moved from here yeah. to here to here. But I'm sure it's all part of a bigger plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're moving around the golf carts, actually. Yeah. <laughs> they're making a roadway for them. They're Jimmy Hoffa's body. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Safety School update. safety, we have a, a, an update, um, and actually I think um, Jess was at the presentation on the Tuesday after we dismissed from uh, the school year last year. We had a presentation, and actually it was just really a gathering. Um, Northboro and Southboro uh, community members have formed um, their own sort of safety study group, and we agreed that we would work in partnership one, with one another. That evening was an evening for um, just conversation about their concerns and to gather some input. Uh, Chief Liver from Northboro was there, and um, Mike Bissett, Detective Bissett, who's the school resource officer at Algonquin. Uh, Kevin Landry, who's uh, our school resource officer here, was unable to come, but he was definitely there in spirit. I think we were there, uh, um, the lights almost went out. We were there probably for about four hours. It almost felt like a living room, uh, and we were just sitting and having a conversation about a variety of topics. But one of the um, outcomes of that work with this group is that um, we were able to bring the Sandy Hook Promise to Algonquin uh, the Tuesday before we opened school for a presentation about what they have to offer us as we continue to uh, provide for a safe school environment for our students. Not just about practices, policies, and protocols, but rather how can we make every student feel that they are a part of the school life. And I, I liken it somewhat to uh, Rachel's challenge, where uh, just you know go up to someone after Columbine and just say hello. And as Kathleen mentioned, um, you know just say hello is really part of um, one piece of the Sandy Hook sort of program offerings. So what we, um, how we approached this was to invite all of our guidance counselors, our school adjustment counselors, um, our basically our professionals who support the social emotional uh, well-being of our students by profession or job title. We all do that every day, but to have them come in and just to listen to the presentation. There's a copy of uh, the material that they left uh, with us. Uh, there's a lot of different pieces of this program offering. It is free to school districts. And we wanted to get some feedback from our professionals to see whether this is something that we wanted to um, embrace holistically, whether there were pieces of this that already support our work. And a brief survey um, went out to all of the participants, and so we look forward to the information uh, and the feedback from them. But it is something that we intend to partner with. We're just, at this point, not sure um, if it's the entire program or if it's really pieces of that that um, will support and enrich what we already have in place. Uh, there are two things that are important, or two things that are very much of interest. They do provide an anonymous tip hotline, something that we've been talking about with both uh, police departments, and it's part of um, their offerings, if you will. Uh, it's foundation-based, so there are no grants that are necessarily um, needed to be written to access some of this material. And so I'm hopeful that by next month we will have um, some updates in terms of where we're going with this. Uh, it was a very busy Tuesday. The offer uh, to attend was extended to our administrators, but we also knew that we were going to be circling back and having some more conversations about uh, whether or not and how this fit into sort of our curriculum of social emotional health and um, also the safety uh, readiness activities that take place in our schools. So um, Steve mentioned uh, PBIS. Um, positive behavioral interventions, and we do have those in our schools now. So how can this enrich that work? So we were we were really pleased, and I think this was one of the um, the requests, if you will, of this group that we take a look at this, and we were able to do that. So I also think that uh, speaks well of the relationship that we're forming with with this group as well as we move forward, um, and more to come from that. It starts with hello. Yes, that was. So that's actually a national, and uh, a nationwide initiative sponsored by the Sandy Hook Promise, which is um, taking place within the next couple of weeks. So we hope that more schools may decide to, to join in that um, as well. 
Questions on that before we move on? 2018-19 subcommittee is eight. liaison assignments. We know this yeah, in June. It's just for distribution. Right. And I'm sure we'll be adding some study groups as the year moves on, mm -hmm. um, as interests present themselves. Um, also in your packet is a request that the committee take a vote on the summer payroll warrants. It is a matter of practice that we have one person signing the warrants over the summer, but they have asked us to take a formal vote. So they have this as a matter of record. So it's just really voting on the fact that we have one person who signs the warrants over the summer. It isn't a problem. They just need a vote for their record uh, to indicate that that's what, we are, that's what we've done for practice. And as we know, we looked into that, and it's what we've been doing for years. We just need to take a vote on that. So, so what is the actual motion? Um, we vote that there would be a primary signer of payroll and warrants during the summer months and that any member may serve as an alternate. <coughs> I would just vote into record the last I just, sentence. Can I just so move that? I so move you. Okay. <laughs> Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Great. Thank you. Unanimous. Superintendent's report to the committee update on summer projects. I think we've touched upon just about each of the projects. Uh, yep. We talked about communications and the phone, the phone um, telecommunication system, a massive project, phenomenal uh, work by uh, the tech folks, particularly Andy Mariotti and um, TJ Karen. Uh, we had an occasion to, as we were moving about the campuses this <coughs> summer, uh, watch the uh, vendor <laughs> Metropolitan uh, Communications work collaboratively with our custodial crew and I've never seen such a happy camper group of vendors coming in to do installation in 90 degree weather and it was clean it was smooth and for us to say it seemed like it was just done so quickly and rapidly probably doesn't do justice to the amount of work and planning that needed to go into that but one of the great things about our communication system is that it really has increased our safe school readiness um, functionality because from any phone you can page you can contact and that prior to this, uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, lots of times they had to go through the main office. They didn't have 911 access. So one of the, one of the concerns and one of the features of this uh, new installation was actually to enhance our safety um, call alerts, not only within the campus, but outside the campus. And so we do have that now. And you know, thank you to the administration for supporting the training that was necessary. We have a few little bumps in along the way with um, scheduling the phone, the, um, the bells, and, and, and some of that, but I think it's being worked out. And speaking of humps and bumps, um, I don't know if anyone's <laughs> noticed, but oh, yes. they actually don't, yeah. there's no longer an airborne reality when you come <laughs> with bumps. And <laughs> I want to thank um, the town, Karen Galgan mm -hmm. and the DPW crew, for supporting that work. Uh, we were able to work out sort of um, a no-cost option for that installation, which is great. Um, Neary was scheduled to have their new humps um, installed, but the time just did not allow for that to happen with the weather conditions and so forth. You may have also noticed that the Woodward driveway enhancements have not yet taken place. Um, from all change comes some good, and in this case, knowing um, the conversations we had this summer about access to the camp, the um, public safety building from Woodward, it may actually be fortuitous that it, it take place at the end of the year because we're not really sure still what kinds of access or, or um, tie in to the Woodward school might be necessary. So it's good that that finish before we start you know, adding new asphalt to the Woodward driveway that might end up having to be uprooted once laid down because of that. So. Um, there is no cost escalator. We've, we spoke to the vendors early, um, had a couple meetings with them, and what we're um, planning to do is, is to have all that work done in June because the public safety building is slated to be complete as well. So that work will be done and our work will be complete. So it's nice to know that um, there's no increase in cost even though we're extending it to June. And Steve, I, I, I think it was safe to say that everyone around the table that day just went, oh, because they thought, I think, that we were going to be insistent that it start 
Um, part of the other problem was the weather just was not agreeing with us and it delayed a lot of their projects so that would have meant that we would have started started um, construction two weeks before school opened and they would not have been able to finish the project and that would have just been a disruptive force and speaking about future disruptive forces um, we're somewhat pleased that the anticipated busing um, issues for Woodward um, did not happen because they managed to do a lot of the road r repair and <coughs> construction before school was back in session and the Main Street project which will be somewhat of um, a concern because I don't, I don't even know if I want to say this the buses will probably be rerouted to go around that work um, is slated to start in the spring now so um, we'll have time to uh, have those conversations with the bus company around um, changes that might need to be made because of the construction on Main Street. And that initially we thought it was all going to happen at once. Mm -hmm. So that's good news. Um, also speaking of Woodward, um, and uh, would ask your approval tonight to, to consider this. Um, Cl uh, Clayton and Kathleen mentioned um, the Eagle Scouts. They've been busy mm -hmm. and they've also been busy at Woodward. And um, I'm going to turn this over to Steve to share the good news. But SEF had um, uh, actually funded a grant for some exciting work at, at Woodward School. Mm -hmm. And because it's about to be complete, uh, they would like us to consider uh, naming this. Uh, I'm going to, uh, it's like the Academy Awards, you don't want to open the envelope <laughs> yet, right? But um, naming this. And uh, Steve will continue, but we do have a policy which is uh, F100 about naming facilities. It really m mirrors the garden, the, um, the outdoor garden space. So I would um, ask that after Steve shares his good news, we consider um, allowing the naming to continue with the opening of the and the celebration of uh, the work that's being done at, at Woodward. So I've left you in suspense long enough, right? Steve, can take I it just, away. Can I just sound? It's a two part project taking place at Finn as well, so the naming would need to take place at Finn as well. So it's a two-part. Okay. Thank you. There's no way I can meet Part A and Part B. I know, I built you right up. It's like dynamite, right? It's explosive. So, um, so uh, last year, I think a year and a half ago, um, SEF had awarded a grant for a story walk, um, which was basically um, this the story walk project comes from Mount Hillier, Vermont, where it's um, a way to lay out a book um, in multiple frames around a particular area, maybe it's a walking trail or pathway, and it allows students to interact with the text, um, reading with loved ones out in the community, um, and following the book from page to page, from station to station. Um, SEF would like to honor um, former principal James Randall um, with, this, um, with this project, and um, they had proposed uh, naming it or, or honoring him with some sort of plaque um, that, would, uh, that would be displayed on the first piece. Uh, back to uh, the, the first frame, I should say, is like a title page almost. Um, back to the work that was done, Alex Forrest, who is a former um, Woodward student and Finn student, I believe, um, is a Algonquin High School senior now. And um, he did a great job coordinating the efforts, um, working with the DPW to dig the holes to supply the um, gravel that would fill the holes. He worked with Troop One out of Southboro to um, really bring this project to life. Um, uh, so I just want to make sure that that he is um, recognized for all of his hard work and efforts. Lori Weiner has been um, an integral staff member as far as coordinating efforts between SEF and, and Alex. So um, I applied, applaud all of them for all their hard work. And I guess the question is um, the, the approval of, of um, dedicating it to former principal James Randall. And if I can assure the committee, there are five steps. We, we actually um, unknowingly <coughs> completed steps one, two, three, and four. And, and that is really just having folks from the community participate in this and then suggest some names that might be submitted for this. It's very similar to the um, outdoor garden dedicated um, to Charles Cron. So, um, and I think it would look similar to that as well. So the fifth step is actually, um, in order to be selected, a name must receive a majority vote from the school committee. And um, you know, with Jim <coughs> being um, such a much beloved principal at both Finn and Woodward, it would seem to be a logical name to move forward for a vote of consideration. What are steps one through four again? One is to um, the superintendent appoints a committee inclusive of school staff. Sounds like Lori Weiner's school staff. Administration, we had Steve. Parents and community members, SEF, 
and the part that wasn't there is a school committee member was to be involved but I don't know if anyone on the school committee was part of SEF or you know knowledgeable about the project over the last two years but I I would suggest somebody must have been aware of it somewhere along the way so maybe we there's that one piece two is um, student school staff and, and residents could submit nominations to this step one committee um, three uh, three names no more than that to the superintendent we have Jim and Jim um, same name but in two places so we're just missing a third and then four is um, after the superintendent approves the nominations I can't think of anyone more worthy of an honor um, forwards them to school committee and here we are at step five for the school committee to vote to accept okay so we'll move that we accept uh, Jim Randall's as the um, designee for this honor at Finney Woodward at Finney Woodward yeah Second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? <clears throat> I would agree that Jim is uh, more than worth the. Uh, you know, he really he did an incredible job here at both schools, mm -hmm. and uh, at a time when we really needed him to. When, uh, when uh, Mary Ryan retired, and uh, he took over both schools for a number of years, and it was, you know, uh, just a great thing that he did that. So. And he was so passionate about the. <clears throat> He really was a member of the um, reading the Massachusetts Reading Association, and they had many different meetings at, at mm -hmm. Finn, and really uh, worked on a state level uh, to improve literacy. And so, what better honor than to have a story walk in his name? So, good point. <laughs> All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You only need three votes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the capital plan. Capital plan update. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned um, we've everyone sung the praises of Brian Fantoni, who's done such an amazing job, and he will be here next month <coughs> to um, speak to that. Um, we had a conversation last week, and that was one of my questions: How is the path going? And he said that he was going to go out there um, this week just to make sure it was clear and that we had done um, some of the work that was suggested last year. But Karen Galligan also indicated to us last year when we talked about this that she had to bring some machinery down there to actually clear that path. I think she's been a little bit busy with the public safety building. So when Brian, actually Brian took some much deserved uh, vacation time. I don't know how he made it through the summer without all of that and the heat and whatnot, but he did. And um, that's on the list to make sure that it's closed. Because that, we know that's an, 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 a definite to concern. Close to, to close the project, in, in other words, clean oh, it. Oh, yeah. Okay. To, the to way think that of a timeline for that? Or? So Brian um, will probably be back uh, tomorrow morning, actually. And we'll we'll make sure that he circles back. It's on his list of things to do. And if the new machinery or the machinery that needs to be lined up, we've got to coordinate that with Karen. So it's not forgotten. It just is on the list. Okay. So yeah. it, the paving wasn't done or anything like that yet. No, the, the pave there was paving done at Trottier. Um, in addition to the humps and bumps, the town actually did some uh, paving on the entrance road up mm -hmm. to Trottier and mm -hmm. then slightly up to the parking lot. But I don't think they've gone through they the pathway. Okay. They did not. They did not. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Update next month. Okay. Now the capital plan update. Yes, we actually had a subcommittee uh, capital plan meeting yesterday morning. That was uh, probably longer than we thought. Uh, then, uh, Paul and Roger attended. And what you have in front of you is the FY20 draft of a capital plan. Um, we have two versions uh, in conversations with Brian and actually Brent uh, Trottier joined in in the conversations as well we really did a very um, close analysis of what we had been carrying on the capital plan for some time and thought about um, what is actually capital and what should be routine maintenance and repair so it's in the um, it's, I think it's in the handout that I very colorful handout so what we basically did was we pulled some of the items at least off 19 and 20 
uh, into the facilities plan. Uh, you know, for Brian, this is new. He's our um, he's getting his feet wet with this capital plan and maintenance plan, and so really didn't extend beyond 20. But if you look at um, the maintenance plan and then you look at the capital plan, you'll see that some of those items in the maintenance plan really shouldn't be on the capital because they're routine maintenance kinds of things. Things with four buildings, uh, we're always going to be replacing carpeting. We're always going to be painting. We're always going to be doing some annual refreshing of the school. <coughs> and so to have them part of the capital plan really didn't make too much sense. So rather, uh, what we did was really um, dug deeply into what was in the plan and move forward with um, what we suspect will be our major uh, investments um, in the next several years. Being mindful that our capital plan is not really, um, doesn't always translate into warrant articles. We've been very fortunate to be able to fund a lot of this capital work and maintenance work through our facilities revolving uh, account and also budget. So one of the things that we're hoping to do this year is to budget out, uh, we've done this for two years now, but to continue the process of budgeting out our revolving account so that it never goes to zero, but we actually are planful of what we're going to expend from that revolving account and what we're going to spend from budget. An excellent example of, of both is our discussions around the telecommunication system upgrades, uh, whether that was going to be operational and revolving. And as the budget expended this year, we realized that we had opportunities to spend it, to expend it from operational to a great extent and then some in revolving if necessary. The Woodward project, we budgeted that Woodward project out about two years ago as we were looking forward to how we were going to expend those revolving funds. So the Woodward project will be expended wholly from the revolving funds that we have set aside. Um, and they will be there in June. Meanwhile, we're getting additional funding in from, from that, um, from rentals. And that's what we'll be looking at expending um, for some of the capital in 19 and 20. You'll also note that it's a little bit more colorful than usual. Um, as part of our conversation, we talked a lot about what are some great things that we can do in collaboration with the town if we can time it accordingly. A perfect example was the humps at Trottier. Originally, that was a cost to us. That was in our uh, capital plan last year. Um, the Neary humps was added as we moved along and through some conversations with Mark Purple and Karen Galligan um, and a little bit of discussions about what we were doing at Woodward that they're not doing to improve the Woodward campus, um, they were able to make those improvements to us or for us at no cost. So we didn't expend any funding for that, including the paving of, of Trottier up to the point where they paved. Uh, so the, the, the um, the colorful brown or orange, I think Roger referred to that as orange, are opportunities for us to partner with the town and have um, you know, some good timing so that while they're doing some significant projects like the Main Street project, we might have an opportunity to partner with them to do some of the paving that we have on tap. So just some um, active dialogue. We will be presenting this to financial advisory very shortly. And I think for them to see that we're cognizant of the importance of always being mindful of what the town's doing and what, what we're doing and um, working together. Ex example, because Karen was going out for a very sizable asphalt bid for the work that the town was doing, we were able to receive that favorable bid pricing as well for some of the projects that we were going to do, like the Woodward project. So um, it's just a matter of forming a, a partnership. The green is the Trottier track resurfacing, which was approved at town meeting. Um, also, uh, they'll be doing some work, while not scheduled yet, at the Petrie Field, which borders Neary School. And so, as we think about the driveway repairs that might need to, to take place at Neary, that might be an opportunity to have conversations with the town about, you're going to be right there. You know, this is an opportunity for us to do the work. So it's difficult to sort of say it's going to happen in May of 2019 because we're not sure really what the town has. But just to continue that, that awareness on their side and ours, I think will benefit both, both folks. And then the blue, um, and this is really what the town is most concerned about, 
is potential warrant articles because of the size of the work that's going to need to take place. There's no way we can embrace that or include that in any way in our revolving. It's just too much money. Um, the one thing that is true, though, is these numbers have been carried for, for uh, years uh, as a flat number. Um, we are looking at uh, partnering with John Parent from the town, um, on the town side and Karen to get someone in to do some actual pricing of these projects um, and get some real numbers. There are ways out in terms of our capital plan, but we need to refresh these numbers. Um, if the town isn't planning to do that, then we're going to, uh, we're planning to uh, um, issue an RFP to have someone come in and actually take a look at these projects. Part of the dialogue that has been ongoing with the, um, the roofing projects is the feasibility of whether or not when, if and when we move forward with solar, the roof would be folded into that project. So to some extent, it's good that it's out there in terms of need because that will give us time to fully vet that possibility. I mean, obviously, if that happens, then that's the great timing to put the new roof on at the same time. But, you know, those things are still being um, discussed. So the other two things that I would like to point out is how much we've already done um, in FY18. Those, the telephone systems have been replaced in all of our schools, right? So we, have, we are projecting, and, and there's the Woodward project, that 135 for driveway enhancements this year, which will be completed, and we do have the set aside dollars for that. So everything in 18 is paid for and installed. Um, if you look at FY20 as we plan for next year, and, and by the way, we expect that everything in the FY19 column will be completed this year. Uh, if we look at the FY20, you'll notice that, um, in, unless I'm, my bifocals are playing tricks on me here. So in the security upgrade column, we have some upgrades in 20 and 21. We have the pricing for those, and um, they are actual facility upgrades that we would want to be doing in all of our schools at the same time. And that's the challenge, too. What we do in one, we want it to have happen in all four at the same time. Um, you know, we don't, we don't talk a lot about uh, safety in public session, but we, we do know that over time, the requests have been made for cameras and additional um, dual locking systems, and, and those kinds of things are what we're looking into. And those kinds of things would probably be reflected, most reflected in these security upgrades over the next two years. And so um, I think that, that speaks volumes in, of, of just how much we've been mindful and, and uh, listening to folks who have come at, to us and with us at um, various forums that we've had. Uh, we had a number of them last year, and we got some great input from parents. And some of their suggestions are being realized through this plan in the presentation. Uh, it's, it's a very realistic plan at this point. Uh, the town. Uh, financial advisory asked for a 10-year <coughs> projection. Um, difficult to do sometimes, but we tried to get as close to the 10. We fell short by four years, but um, you know, so much of it's going to depend on what we do in, in the earlier years of this plan. This is very much a draft, and we haven't looked at the town's budget calendar yet, but it's it's um, ambitious. So we'll be talking a little bit about that shortly. Um, it was important, I think, for us to take a look at this plan because the town tonight, because the town is, is very much looking to move forward. Certainly they're looking for long-term planning of warrant articles, you know, 10 years out for their own planning purposes. That's why we want to just freshen up these numbers. <coughs> the boiler, uh, just to give you an example, it is an oil burner um, at Finn. I uh, just replaced one in another school, not in Southboro, and the cost is closer to 450 So that's why we need to sort of really refresh these numbers in, and that's um, behind the path, also on Brian's list of things to do, is to get someone in to give us better pricing. But they've assured us, uh, Financial Advisory has assured us that they appreciate the draft format of these, of these documents. So we, we could vote to accept them tonight and meet with Finn uh, Financial Advisory. We could keep them in draft form until after our first meeting with Financial Advisory. I think some of the things that they're looking at is in draft form as well. And they felt comfortable with us having 
a draft rather than a final voted capital plan. That, that's the will of the I'm fine with the draft. I'm fine with the draft. I mean, I'm going to support the support okay. the draft. It doesn't make a lot of sense to right. lose some flexibility if you want to get points. We don't know what the feedback is going to be. And they, and they may want more from us than, you know, than what we have here. So, Okay, great. Uh, enrollments are in your packet. Uh, we are well within class size range, I believe, uh, in all of our classes. Um, I, I think there's a copy of the class size policy in your handouts this evening. Uh, the only class that might be a little slightly below um, because the cap is for the, for the uh, minimum class size number is 16 and that's in kindergarten. But I would say to Clayton, Clayton, wow, you were almost spot on on your projection. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what's the go? algorithm that I used to? <laughs> <laughs> Impressive. So um, that's where we are. We're actually, um, I did hand out the NESDAQ. Uh, NASDAQ had us at K-8 for 18 and 19 at 12.49, so we're about 56 below. And um, if we look at our projections that we had for FY19, we're actually slightly up from our projections. So we'll be watching over this as we move forward. I will say based on the um, budget calendar, we'll be looking at uh, projections for next year very, in probably the next meeting because we'll, we'll need those for for budgeting purposes also in your packet uh, this is something that does not happen uh, too often but um, if you look at where we ended up on the expenditure report we are at Zero, and we are at zero in, in a couple districts. So uh, basically, that means we in, we close spot on what we were budgeted. A um, lot of a lot of folks uh, worked on that. Uh, financial coordinators over the summer, in collaboration with Brian Valentine and um, and his team at Townhouse. So we were. I know that isn't always what the town would like, manager would like to see. I think they'd like to see a few dollars left, but from my standpoint, I was ecstatic. So um, there you have it. We spent what, what was budgeted. And again, you know, great work by um, a lot of folks to, to move this to this point. So this evening, uh, of course, we are audited. We would need a vote to accept, uh, to approve until audited. I move we approve the fiscal year 18, the final fiscal year 18, 2018 budget as submitted until audited. Second. Second by Tura. Any discussion? All in favor. And just when we finish 18, there we have 19 and follow us right behind. And so this is, uh, this is the first of the new year. And uh, we encumbered a lot this year. Um, we did purposeful encumbrances so that we had a, you know, over the summer, so that we had a better feel for where we are in terms of our balance, even though it's this early in the school year. So you'll note that there's a lot of encumbrances in there. That, that is not that we expended them, but we know that those dollars are spoken for. So basically, they're spoken for, in the most cases, their salaries. So now what do we have left? And that, that's very helpful as we move through the budget season. So that's where we are right now. And um, again, first one of, of the year. So I uh, would ask, please, to a vote to approve until audited on the FY19 budget. I'll move we approve the fiscal year 19 budget as submitted until audited. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. I'm lo we're losing the crowd over there, so I'm going to go a little bit back. <laughs> um, kindergarten, very exciting. This was the second year of reductions. Um, as discussed, uh, we were able to reduce tuition 
yet again by $950, so we're at $2,000 in uh, two fiscal years, which is exciting for our parents. Uh, there was a letter that was sent out in August to our um, incoming kindergarten uh, parents, and with Clayton's expert algorithm, uh, it will be very helpful then if, if that holds true to predict further reductions. I believe uh, we are on track. It's a little premature, but it, we could realize a free tuition at the beginning of next year, depending on what this year's um, revolving account funds yield in the budget process. So again, almost the same conversation last year this time, being mindful, being watchful, but we should have some good indications by January or February this year. Um, always reluctant to say too much too soon because things could change, mm -hmm. but um, we're, we're making some, we're on track. Budget priorities, uh, FY20 budget priorities uh, are in your uh, packet. I will also say that South Borough's circuit breaker actual dollar increase from moving to 60 to 72 percent is a was $71,253. And that's uh, safely tucked away in our circuit breaker revolving account. That's going to be helpful when we get to the budget process. Because sure. that could be additional funding that we apply to FY20. Should that first bullet have to be Are we on budget priorities? Yes. Flip some papers here. Yes. Say either strategically planned or strategic planning. Or is it supposed to say what it says? It is strategically planning for the future. It is. Okay, so that's the... That, that is, um, we can double check it, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah. We've, we've said it both ways, actually. But it was Vision 2020, strategically planning for the future. As long as it says what you want it to say. Budget priorities have changed a little bit, I guess, year to year. Um, but it has to be that way. So, if anyone has suggestions for changes for this year, we're happy to hear them. I do. I don't know. We had some conversations about world language, and so we want to make sure that whatever direction that we take is part of the budget priorities. And I think bullet number one, two, three probably touches upon that a little bit. So, uh, I just wanted to to put that, move that forward because that is a conversation we're going to have uh, next month <coughs> and we want to make sure that while we're considering budget priorities, there's a place for it to be supported and I think that fits very nicely in, in terms of supporting our world language. Certainly preparing our students globally for the 21st century is definitely something that we so fit into that. You're saying if it might, it might make sense to have some specific reference to it in that bullet? Or I think it covers it. I mean, it's up to the committee, but I think. Yeah. I, I was wondering about that actually, mm -hmm. so I'm glad you said that. Yeah. And certainly, we don't, we do not need to approve these tonight. Right. It's just sharing uh, that these are in draft form, and they really just, if they look familiar, they're 19 uh, um, budget priorities. on this and we'll bring it up next month. Yeah. Good as written. Yeah. Want to give it a month? And oh, I, I think that sounds good. Okay. Yeah. In that case. And here is a little bit of exciting uh, conversation. So there are actually three documents before you. Um, the first is the calendar that we used historically. So it's the calendar that we use to present this year's budget. On the flip side is the calendar that I was actually proposing based on conversations that we had over the summer and maybe in June and, and, and so forth with the town. Um, Mark Purple, when they d made the decision to move up town meeting. Uh, so town meeting is now in March rather than April. Last year it was April 9th. This year, it's March 23rd. So taking that into consideration, I backed up some of the dates and compressed the timeline. And then 
I actually um, received the draft of the budget calendar for FY20 from the town. So if I could just do a visual and suggest that this was condensed, it's pretty much half of that in terms of timeline right now. So basically what they're looking for, and that's, in, that's um, a handout as well. You might have it as one of the ones that I provided you in your, uh, here with the paperclip version. The budget is due to the town, and I'm, I'm not gonna look up at uh, my, the administrators over there quite yet. Um, we've had some preliminary discussions about this and have sort of a tentative plan in place but there's no way around it. This is ambitious. Um, it says that the budgets are due, and, uh, and, and noon is in bold, so I think that's high noon reference, uh, on October 17th. So for us, it's a, a huge departure from the norm. Um, I pulled up last year's uh, book that um, was shared with advisory, and we actually presented to advisory on January 31st. This year, advisory um, will review our budgets, which probably means we'll be presenting to them on December 12th. So um, it's ambitious, uh, and we will basically start conversations about budget next week. Uh, one of the things that we are going to do that will help, I think, our administrators tremendously is to allow them to enter their FY20 numbers directly into iVisions, which we've not really done before, and allow you to put those details of what you're, you're looking at uh, proposing for budget expenditures next year right in the system. So it really cuts out about two weeks of paper. So you'll be able to see your 19 and, and we'll be able to put those 20 estimates right in there and the principals will be able to have everything just enclosed right in the system, which should um, definitely prove far more efficient for us in our processing behind the scenes. Uh, and we'll be doing some uh, training on, on that next week. Um, we've talked already at Central about how we can have sort of the technology needs conversation and the special ed needs conversation so that we can work in collaboration with our principal. Um, our staffing, uh, projections for 20 uh, met with Nina and, uh, and Becky and we're rolling up FY20 projected salaries within the next week and we all know that's about 85 percent of the budget but our staffing projections will totally be based on you know anticipated students already in the system and Clayton's extraordinarily accurate kindergarten projections. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you know that's what we're working with. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> Beyond me, how a two-week change in town meeting translates into yeah. two months plus change in the budget process, but whatever. But the good news, there's there's Ray, you know there's always sunshine somewhere. Um, that means by. The December break, we should be finished, South Road. You know that's a stretch for all of us, but that's the ray. Of, you know that's the ray of hope at the end, because we will have presented to them on, on December 12th, and we'd be able then to put South Road's budget together. You know, it's different for us, but other communities, you know, Westboro votes their budget in October <coughs> every year, but they're used to that budget cycle. So for us. It's a shift. It's a change. And I'm with us. So, so we don't have to have our final proposed budget and public hearings, etc., before all before October 17th. Then we just have to have something to submit to advisory and the selectmen. I would suggest is that correct because, that but they're, if they're publishing the warrant, I mean, the warrant right. is closed November 11th. So do we have to have the publish pub until much later? The public hearings, like how are we gonna? I would suggest that we would at least <laughs> want to review it at a preliminary level, um, 
the conversations I've had with, with Adrian, who's the financial advisor, advisory chair, is that if changes are made, we can always amend on the town floor. Which is probably not, not the most a, desirable. Um, I think, you know, we've spoken a little bit about this. Uh, the bigger challenge, while not necessarily a K-8 issue, uh, because Southboro votes the Algonquin Regional Budget, we have we do not have any numbers, any firm numbers, even from the state until February, and wow. sometimes we're hard pressed to vote Algonquin in March. Hmm. So, um, if this is the timeline. We will be amending the regional budget on the town floor, mm -hmm. unless something miraculous happens with, you know, getting the numbers. Uh, one of the big impacts uh, for K-8s and also for regional is health insurance costs. Yeah. So we know, at the regional level, if we have an increase of about three percent, almost one and a half percent of that is life is is health insurance. So, you know, right now they're projecting an 8% increase on, on health insurance. So if we're seeing that at the regional level, then the town is seeing that. And we had the 11th hour changes, you know, just in health insurance when we were pretty much voting the recommended budget at, at the high school. So the town will, will have that same issue. So it's going to be a very interesting year. Um, respect the, the timeline that they have and, you know, we will certainly do 150% effort to put, to get this into to you know timeline. And you know the it's probably not a bad idea to try to get into a regimen of you know moving the process. Up. It's not a bad idea, but um, certainly what's going to happen um, is there will be still ongoing discussion dealing with changes, you know, which will then translate into amendments down forward. I don't necessarily know that that translates into a lot more discussion if, if there's a, a lot of agreement from the committees at that time on the amendments, but still it is what it is. So ba back to Hattura's question too, if I look at the selectmen vote the budgets, mm -hmm. the 29th, so from that date, from now to that date, um, actually earlier than that date, probably around the 30th, uh, we would need to vote at least a preliminary. We've been very fortunate over the last, I don't know how many years, but the last four or five years, I can only remember us changing the preliminary maybe once slightly. So we vote the preliminary in January. What we, we've been voting the preliminary in January so that when we've gone to financial advisory, uh, oftentimes the discussion was such that we voted the preliminary and the recommended at the same time, you know, that we didn't have that additional month. I think when we went to advisory last year, just looking at the presentation that we, we had, when we went to advisory last year, we had a really strong preliminary and they asked whether we thought we would change it. So we voted the recommended at the tw at the February 14th South Broadway, but there were no changes from it. So it was pretty firm. There's no, you know, indication that <coughs> we wouldn't have been able to do that again. But again, that was in January, not October. Okay. So uh, additionally, they had asked, you know, so what do you think your increase is going to be? I said, well. <laughs> You know, the biggest die from the sky, but um, generally we've seen a three for a five percent range, three to five. Uh, and and Mark uh, Purple said that seemed reasonable, uh, and everybody seems to think that's reasonable. So it's reasonable, and I guess you know we come in and somewhere in that, and that would be what they expect. Um, Can I make one request uh, for the principals? which I've done the last several years, I think. I think it's great to see not only what's in the budget, but what you wish was in the budget. So it's kind of a wish list at the end. And it's generated some really good discussions among advisory when we've done that. Um, I think, well, the kindergarten mm -hmm. was one good example. I think language was another where, you know, they're interested and, you know, they want to know what we're thinking about. And if we can gin up support early, then I think we're more likely to get it. Okay. I'd appreciate it if you could think about that. 
Okay. And some of the feedback from the principals last year uh, was that um, the process didn't allow them to, to have that conversation as much as we had in the past. And so this year, I think if when they go into infinite visions and they represent what they want compared to 19, we would be able to extract some of that because we can always we're, we're going to have to reduce because we don't always budget what what all we want right um, but that would be a great snapshot as well to see that preliminary run of put what you want in there <coughs> and then that we can extract for the school committee and show what we've reduced which is just a natural part of the process mm -hmm. anyways and generally I don't think we've lobbed off any particular programs but we've maybe have trimmed so that would be good to have as we go through the the March to October 17th. A hush well, falls I just, over the crowd. <laughs> I'm just still trying to understand what we're going to do. So are we are we then at our next regular meeting that we have here? Are we planning on sort of preliminarily approving a budget that would go to advisory is that the idea so there's going to be and are we having subcommittee meetings between now and then in order to come up with the preliminary budget and is that is that the idea <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do behind the scenes yeah okay we have a lot of data gathering uh, some of it's already in motion imagine. so uh, their main we may find ourselves in a situation between whatever dates here, October 17th and November 30th. Um, besides our November school committee meeting, we may need another school committee meeting. Um, we'll certainly have budget subcommittee meetings. We generally have one or two before we even get to the preliminary vote, and then we generally have one between preliminary and recommended, mm -hmm. just to make sure we're, we're all aligned with the numbers. Uh, what's missing here is the November date. I, I would suggest that it will be nearly impossible for me to have budget numbers in the format that's anything credible by our next October meeting. <laughs> it's just you, too much data to put together. If you, yeah. If you think about the date, and, and you said this, you said uh, been to advisory. Well, so our meeting's on the tenth, right? Yeah. October tenth. So. This says a week after that, the budget has to be submitted to the selectman's office. Right. You know, um, which means there's not a lot of there's not a lot of time to have dialogue with the advisory. Yeah. Right. yeah. So I, you know, this is, I think it's a, it's an experiment. Flexibility is probably positivity <laughs> and flexibility will be the illies that illities that we need to think about here. Um, so we need to leave here positive. I've, so what, whatever we submit on October 17th by noon, can I knew, that be changed? <laughs> Bold noon. Yeah. Can that be changed after that? Or is the only way to change that it can to do changed. an amendment on this, the floor? Yeah, this, this, no, no, it can no, be no, changed. No, this, okay. Yeah, this is not okay. a, yeah, this is not a uh, uh, regulation or anything like that. This yeah, is, yeah, yeah. All this is just But if the warrant is closed on December 11th, Sorry? The warrant is closed on December 11th, so then that's the point at which. So the warrant being closed is the language in the warrant. Yeah. Sometimes it's not the number in the warrant okay. when the warrant's closed. Okay. It's like, what are all the articles, right? Um, Roger, I'm looking at you for confirmation on this. I know sometimes they've asked for the language of the warrant, and it's kind of boilerplate language for us about the, the budget, and we've been able to fill in that budget number after the fact. Yeah, we, we, we don't. Um, we don't have the same issue that some other um, people submitting warrants do okay. because ours, ours really is kind of a template to fill in the number. The one thing That's I'm fine. thinking That's about is, I just don't know that it applies. I really don't know, actually. I'm going to attend advisory tomorrow night. Typically, you can't increase your number a lot from what's in the warrants. That's the general um, practice. Now I don't know how. Well, so I, I think I think uh, I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna go to the okay. budget when I sort of ask the question about budgets in general because uh, because long, as far as language as long as language is generally the same the 
it's okay. You know, people, people change the language on town for a lot. You just can't go in with a different, you know, you know kind of kind of a totally different concept, if you will, than, than what you were going in with. But, uh, okay. I mean, I'm really okay. interested in this, you know, does, does everything have to be high because you can't increase? Yeah. Right. And that's, and that's with an early warrant mm -hmm. closing, that's, that might be a challenge, but, you know, we're going positive here. So. Yeah. From a budget standpoint, it would seem that the request to have sort of two tiers would be essential in this case. So, you know, the, the kinds of things that the principals might put in their budget, but keep it as realistic as possible, but know that if we had to come down, because that might be some of the conversations, then what's the, what's the B list yeah. that would be the kinds of things that we would want to reduce? So to, to that point, if we're here and then we're told we need to come down, we've already identified the areas that we would reduce. Because this is very different from us. By the time we've gone in, that conversation about reductions to get into, you know, um, to get into alignment with the town has already happened. Now it may be that this is what we present and that alignment conversation takes place after we present to financial advisory. So for me, if I look at this whole um, chart, the date that I'm backing into is sort of December 11th and 12th yeah. when we go to financial advisory and do our presentation and, and kind of have the preliminary numbers in good shape with maybe that plan B to go in and do reductions if we need to. Um, because when we go to financial okay. advisory, and I can't speak for what is in their mind when they put this together in terms of what their expectations are, but when we've gone to financial advisory before, it, it's been sort of a preliminary but firm. Um, what was that fake real money that you used earlier? <laughs> so I love that. So, um, you know, that's pretty much what it would be, I think. And then that, that gives us a little bit more flexibility of time because we also have to remember that there's like a couple, there's a major holiday in there which usually shuts down the world when the, when the you know when the turkeys start popping into the oven so we've got a lot of time there we don't have a lot of time um, but we, we you know we'll start the work and, and and try to back into this as much as possible we'll be having a lot of meetings to me the key date is brownies. So let me vote on the fiscal 20 budgets, January 29th. So if we would approve ours at our January meeting, it should be fine. Which would be a month earlier. Positively flexible. Isn't that what you, your proposed calendar says? My proposed calendar? Yeah, that that was based with this this um, call I put together before I saw this. Oh, okay. So this was the one that I thought was probably going to be a like a one month early budget right. process, and then this one. I don't know. I think it's okay. So. It's 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 interesting though. The top part's really bold. It's that's really serious language, and the rest of it is sort of just <laughs> budget light. You know, so I'm hoping that means that there's some flexibility there, and that the bold language they're really taking seriously, but appreciate that they might have to have some revision yeah, there. I mean, that's, that's, deadline that's how I'm there's looking. There's at deadlines. That. There's padded deadlines. Yeah. There's real deadlines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to me, selectmen vote on the fiscal 25. That's a real deadline. Warrant to be signed by selectmen Tuesday, February 19. That's a real deadline. That's it. Yeah, but this, this was the question that remains is, you know, what flexibility is there between, let's say this, well, let's say December 11th is warrant closed dates, and you know, what? Uh, I guess I, I guess it's really when the selectmen take a position, <coughs> yeah, they voted. Yeah, the January until late February. Lots of times when Mark will call it and, and when he, you know, when we talk about the warrant, it's about new language for the warrant right. being presented, not the actual dollars. So it's, you know, do you have any warrant articles? Like, oh, we're going to move the, one of the roofs forward or something like that. Not necessarily the finite numbers that are going to be on the warrant, but clearly 
the 25th it's going to the printer so that's it that's a bold line that's, a real that's an un, un yeah. bolded line um, so I think there's a little bit of flexibility but there's absolutely no doubt we're sort of fast tracking this process yeah. right. so next month we would almost have to vote the budget priorities because we yep. use them as reference a lot during the budget preparation yep. we also have to also we're going to have to have a preliminary budget number right? next month. Sometime next month. We right. might need another meeting to just talk budget. Well, we'll definitely have subcommittee meetings. Yeah, we can have a lot of current meetings <coughs> with subcommittees. But that's, that's exciting news. <laughs> yeah. Um, Here's the positivity. I'm, I'm going to look up yeah. across the table there. And it's exciting news. Putting it in right now. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Keep positively positive, positive. Charismatic positivity. Charismatic positivity. Yeah. That's what it is. We're just we're gonna say every day. Posit charismatic positivity. All right. Yeah. Uh, educational policy, not at this time. <clears throat> policy development and distribution. We have a few distributions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we did just distribute the index. Uh, Cheryl is trying to guide everyone towards the virtual version of the um, of our policies, so they're all up online. But here, um, here is the index of all the policies that we have. And then the religious observance policy was actually voted uh, in June at the combined meeting, and so there it is just for distribution purposes. And Greg has been busy setting policies up candidates. So it looks like there's a policy meeting coming up and forth. We will be having a combined meeting. Um, we just haven't had a successful doodle yet um, because we do want to, and Julie, this is a, a battle cry here for us, uh, get the acceptable use policy moving along, the social media policy, because we'd love to have that possibly voted at the second combined meeting this year, which unless we add one would be December. Um, and if we could get it to a first read on the 26th, that would be great. We might make that timeline. <coughs> okay. Uh, personnel items, distribution. I did want to point out, uh, this is kudos to Jennifer Henry. You might know her as Jennifer Ostroff. So Jennifer Ostroff's been in our district for, as, as an employee of the district, a well-respected employee. She's a BCBA bird sort of, Board Certified Behavioral Analyst. It's, I'm practicing. Um, and so she has uh, moved into the role of a preschool coordinator and we're really excited for her. I think she's going to do an amazing job. And um, Clayton was, you know, very much a supporter of that and uh, met with her several times. So She's doing great. Yeah. She's hit the ground running. And yeah, so we're excited for it. Um, she's moving on. Communications. So this was our second constant contact distribution. There's a postcard in there somewhere. We have these postcards all around town. And interestingly enough, we've had more than ever uh, people subscribing to con constant contact who are not school uh, family members, community members. So that's kind of exciting. And last year we maybe had a handful. This year I think we're up to about 90, which is a lot. Oh, the letters from uh, UMass Lowell Symphonic Band Can for uh, yeah, I got maybe the 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 so this is a great exciting receipt. news. I don't know if the administrators want to share the, the good news about Lindsay and Lee hmm. or not. Yes. <laughs> We're excited. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll share about Lee. That Lindsay, I'm not sure. Uh, Yeah, was Lee especially? I guess she should have right. been an assistant director or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, her, you, her um, symphonic band. Oh, yes. Yeah. You were thinking. Loves it. I was thinking of something else. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, no, not that. that sure. Sure. We'll save that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so the, the accommodation for both of them and their commitment to, I don't think this is their first year doing it, but really they, 
they do such a wonderful job meeting the needs of all of our students in at Neary, but above and beyond that, the participation in this during the summer months is just incredible and speaks volumes to to their commitment to bringing music education to all kids. So really, um, it was wonderful for them to share these letters with us, and I shared them with Superintendent Johnson so that they could part, be a part of their. Um, they're fine. So, like they <coughs> Seem like they're being positive role models for our students. Absolutely. Charismatic, Keith just said. It's Absolutely. <coughs> it's true. Also, with your um, school committee meeting dates, this is something very exciting um, in the world of scheduling. Uh, sometimes out of the um, uh, in the most unexpected moments, you get a call saying, uh, are you in town? Can you come in and sign the warrants? So this year, uh, we finally were able to work together over the summer and put an actual schedule together for school committee members to know when to come in. Uh, it's this strange looking list, and um, it will say exactly the days we're going to have warrants for you. We will always have a pile of great things to sign at school committee meetings. We are um, backing into combined meetings, so usually everybody's there, so we'll have um, warrants there as well. But if you look at the South Borough column, you'll see that you'll be signing um, on the 10th and the 24th. Uh, and we're going to try to adhere to this schedule as closely as we possibly can unless there's an extreme circumstance. Um, and so you can plan around these dates and not have to worry about getting calls. And, can you run right over and sign? So this, this is, is something great. we've been trying to do for a while, and we've been able to do that this year. Very good. Nice. So, not that you schedule your world around warrant signing, but this might help if you do. <coughs> and then we'll call. Or we'll knock on your door. All right, action on minutes from uh, the June 13th, 2018 meeting. <coughs> we to approve. Definitely budget conversations and vocal budget oh, priorities. Yeah. Could we get an update on the school lunches? I've been asked several times from different parents about it. In terms of the finance, in terms of? Um, in terms of changing up the lunch menu, sure. conversations yes. that happened uh, in the yes. spring. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Brings us to audience sharing once again. Anyone have anything still to do? I, I have one thing. It's in your what? packet. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. This um, actually came up on June 26th as well, just for general sharing. Um, this was held. This uh, activity. This presentation was held in uh, several high schools. Most recently, Franklin High School, and actually a participant in the Safe School, um, North Coast South Coast Safe School Working Group. 
that was present on June 26 is working very closely with the Metro West Commission on the Status of Women. This is going to be held at the Northboro Library. It will go out as a as part of a one call just to make sure people are aware of this. Um, I actually think I'm on the panel, or I think that's what happened last Wednesday when we were at the meeting. Uh, but it, it should be an interesting um, conversation and exchange of information. It is a significant issue with young teens and um, should be a very important formative evening. So it's revenge porn and teen sexting. Uh, originally it was going to be sponsored at the high school and uh, that was moved to, um, you know, to the town library in Northboro. There's more information on the website. This will be posted on our district site as well. Very serious um, but important topic um, that unfortunately affects our teens okay. and, and younger students as well. Really anyone who's using the social media. So um, we're going to make this available and send that out. Okay. Yes. How about a motion to adjourn? Make a motion that we adjourn. Second. Second. Again. All in favor? Thank you, Governor.